Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. Today, we got another Mr. Ballin' one. And this one is, This island kept a dark secret until 2004. Mature audiences only. So if you ain't mature, and you watch this, it's on you, not me. It's on you. So let's get right into this. Hey, gentlemen, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment what you think down below. You guys ready? Of course you're ready. Let's go. This story was kept top secret by the U.S. military until 2004. The story itself is unbelievable, but it's the twist at the very end that you'll remember. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the like button's hand sanitizer with lubricant right before they go out to run some errands. Also, please. Oh, that's messed up. That ain't messed the hell up. You don't be, don't you dare do that ever. Don't you dare. I'd smack you if you did. Subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Let's. What did this island do? Chichijima is a small Japanese island about 500 miles south. Chichijima, holy crap, I don't, I don't know how he said that, that's a tongue twister. Of the Japanese mainland. During World War II, the Japanese put a base on this island and they put two radio towers at the top of the two mountains on the island. These radio towers became integral to the Japanese communication and surveillance operations in the Pacific during the war. And so at that time, the island was heavily fortified with up to 25,000 troops and huge anti aircraft guns. Because of the island's obvious strategic value to Japan, the Americans wanted to take it from them. But American. I mean, obviously, us Americans watching everything, especially in wars, we have to, we feel we, we gotta win, obviously, in our minds, so. That sounded weird, never mind. Of course you wanna win. That's a stupid way I worded that. It's like I'm mad at them for winning. I'm not. It just came out wrong. Um. But it it is, I will say, it was good on. The J Japanese were going up, like, knowing, okay, this is where our high-tech signal stuff is. We are guarding the hell out of this island, because if anyone goes down, I want to make sure any island or boat or anything can get taken out of the sky or out of the water, and everyone can die. And military strategists advised against that, saying that any amphibious landing of this island would result in massive casualties for Americans, and the Japanese would likely just repel the attack anyways. And so the Americans decided to go with the next best thing, which was to attempt to bomb the two towers and cut out their communications. So in June of 1940... That is also a smart move. Don't go on the island, just take out the... The towers, that's actually a smart move. 44, American aircraft carriers, which are those huge, huge ships that planes can take off of and land on, they headed for the island of Chichijima. And that looks cool. I do love those things. Once the island was completely surrounded, the Americans began launching their pilots to try to take out these towers. But the Japanese fought back in a major way, and despite taking heavy casualties on their side, they repelled every American air raid and kept them from bombing their towers. After several months of these failed missions over Chichijima, the American military leaders were incredibly frustrated. They knew this was going to be a difficult mission, but they didn't expect it to be this difficult. However, this island was so strategically important that the Americans knew they had to just keep on sending pilots in until they took out these towers. And so in September of that year, the Americans were back to planning another raid over Chichijima Island, and one of the pilots selected to go on this particular raid was a 20-year-old named George, who actually was the youngest pilot in the United States Navy at the time. Oh, hell no, don't go on the George. We're going to be focusing on George. How much suffering is George going to have to deal with here? 
time. But despite his age, he'd actually flown in several combat missions already and had actually been shot down already and had to eject into the ocean and was subsequently rescued. On the morning of this raid, George, along with his two-man crew, which was his radio operator named Dell and his door gunner named Ted, they boarded the plane. And then at 7.15 a.m., George and his crew took off along with dozens of other American aircraft that were part of this operation. George immediately climbed above 8,000 feet because that would put them outside of anti-aircraft gun range. And so the way this mission would work is all these pilots would fly over the island and then in order to drop their bombs, they would have to dive down below 8,000 feet and then manually drop their bombs and then try to get back up above 8,000 feet and out away from the island. And so George had run missions like this before and so he was one of the first to actually make that dive down to the island. And as soon as he went below 8,000 feet, the island just erupted with anti-aircraft gun fire. And so all these rounds are coming up, flak is popping all over the place, and George almost immediately notices the side of his plane gets hit. But the plane's stable enough that he decides he's just gonna keep on diving down and complete the mission. And he's yelling back to Ted and to Dell to hold on, and they get all the way down to 3,000 feet when George releases two 500-pound bombs that are direct hits on the radio tower he was assigned to bomb. But at this point, George's plane is now engulfed in flames. It can barely fly, and so George is again Again, yelling at Ted and Dell to hold on. He's pulling back on the lever and he begins to turn himself away from the tower out towards the water. And he manages to fly away from the island, but he can feel the plane starting to go down. Now, George had previously been shot down before, and what he learned from that is how important it was to fly as far away from the enemy as you possibly can before you bail out of your plane. Because if you bail too early and you land in the water right near where the enemy is, you'll just get captured. And so George was holding on to that lever and keeping his plane up as long as he possibly could. And so he's flying and getting lower and lower and lower and closer to the water. And Ted and Dell are yelling at him that they gotta jump out. Meanwhile, outside, the other planes that had sustained damage, the other American planes, their crews are already bailing out. But George is saying, no, hold on. And he keeps going farther and farther until he's so close to the water that it's practically too late. And then he gives the order to jump out of the plane. George abandons his controls. He leaps out the door and he hits his head on the back of the plane as he leaps out. But his chute would open up right before he hit the water and it would save his life. As soon as George hits the water and he comes up for air, he's under his parachute. And so he's trying to get his parachute away way to get a breath of air. He disconnects his parachute from his shoulders. He clears the parachute and he's looking around and he sees his plane that is now being flown by no one go crashing directly into the water. And so immediately he's looking around for Ted and Dell's parachute to make sure they're okay, but he doesn't see any parachutes anywhere. However, George notices a life raft from his plane had miraculously just landed like 10 feet away from him. So he swims over to the life raft, he climbs inside, and once he's in there, all he's thinking about is Ted and Dell. So he's yelling for Ted, he's yelling for Dell, but he's not getting a response. And so George turns around in the raft. So now he's facing towards the island and to his horror, way off on the horizon, right near the edge of this island are Japanese patrol boats that are speeding in his direction. He knows they're coming to get him and the other people that had jumped out of these planes. And so George turns back around, he leaps onto his chest on the front of this raft and he starts using his hands to swim as fast as he can away from this island, the whole time he's screaming out for Ted and Dell in hopes he's going to find them. Little did he know that both of them had not survived the crash. One had not even jumped out of the plane and had died on impact, and the other had jumped out, but their parachute had not inflated. And so George is swimming as fast as... So him waiting... <coughs> My bad. Um, so him waiting till such a last minute thing end up costing them to their lives. Or at least for sure one who couldn't jump out of the plane in time. So one got cost his life because he waited till last second. The other one's parachute just didn't go off so he just crashed and died. Damn. 
as he possibly can and he's yelling out for Dell and for Ted and he's looking but he doesn't hear them he doesn't see them and he knows that not only is he not going to find his friends but there's just no way he's going to outswim these boats and so at some point he just turns around and sits in the raft and he's looking towards these patrol boats and he knows that at some point they're going to come up here and they're going to capture him and all he can think about is how guilty he feels about Ted and Dell and he starts second guessing his decision to keep that plane flying as long as he did and make them bail out so late and he's thinking I probably got them killed and then he thought about his wife and he wondered if he'd ever see her again and then he turned towards these Japanese boats that were much closer now but still fairly far away and he began mentally preparing himself for captivity but before he could be captured American aircraft come storming in overhead and they go flying past him towards the island and they start dropping bombs and strafing these Japanese boats that were coming out to get George and so George is thinking oh my goodness what luck he turns around he gets back on his chest and he starts swimming as fast as he can trying to get away knowing that these boats are totally preoccupied with the aircraft overhead and for two hours George used every ounce of strength he had to swim as far as he possibly could away from this island but at some point he was just so unbelievably exhausted he just could not paddle any farther and so he's just laying on this raft when he hears the sound of something coming out of the water and he turns and he sees the periscope of an American submarine coming out of the water. And seconds later, the crew of this American submarine comes right up alongside him. They grab him out of the raft. What a lucky b man. This man survived. This man got super lucky in the fact that he w once had a chance to get away from these Japanese boats that were coming to capture him and that the submarine showed up that was able to save him. Extremely lucky this boy is. They put him in the submarine and he was saved. Besides George, Ted, and Dell, there were eight other American airmen that had to bail out of their aircraft because they were badly damaged following this raid. And so originally those eight people were not recovered and they were believed to have drowned at sea. But that actually was not true. The U.S. government figured out fairly quickly what happened to them, but the details of what happened to them were so gruesome, the government decided they did not want to tell anyone. They especially didn't want to tell the parents and loved ones of these eight airmen because they believed if they heard the true account, that would be too traumatic for them. And so they They got captured, didn't they? And then the, the, the Japanese, they're some ruthless bastards. And they had, a, they had a right to be in this situation. They had a right to be. You were trying to take and destroy their only their only line of communication. So they were trying, they were coming for you. They, they were coming ruthless. And they were captured and probably did not have a very good result. Made the details of these eight deaths totally top secret. But 60 years later, in 2004, an author named James Bradley discovered transcripts from a post World War II Japanese war crimes trial held in Guam, where Japanese military leaders confessed to what they did to these eight captured Americans. This is the true account. Unlike George, these eight other airmen bailed out almost immediately after they got out over the water. And so that placed them in the water very close to the island and so before the American aircraft could come in and save the day like they did with George these eight airmen were scooped up by the Japanese and brought back to the island the so even though it wasn't a good idea that George's life last chance ejection end up saving at least his life and if he, the other would have gone out right it would have saved theirs too Japanese soldiers on this island for the past several months have been getting constantly bombed by American aircraft, inflicting a very high casualty rate. And so these soldiers hated the Americans and they justifiably so. They wanted revenge against the Americans. And so suddenly you have these eight American prisoners on this island with no one to protect them. And so what do you think happens? The Japanese decide they're going to exact their revenge on these eight men. Within 24 hours of being captured, the eight men were kind of huddled up in one section of the island when one of them, Marv Mershon, who was 19 from Long Beach, California, was grabbed by a Japanese commander, stood up and moved to the central area within their military camp, and they tied him to a tree, and this commander encouraged all of the other soldiers to beat and kick Marv. And so all day long, soldiers were coming up and just 
just beating the crap out of Marv, and Marv is tied to the tree, he can't do anything, and these seven other prisoners are forced to just watch because they can't do anything. And so that night, the same command- That is ruthless. All oh, that is ruthless as all hell to be, to be tied up in a tree. Just vision this, okay? Just vision your Marv here. You are tied up in a tree. And Japanese soldiers are just taking turns, almost like a single file line. They probably ain't doing a single file line, but just kind of vision it. A single file line all coming just to beat, to punch, to kick you all day, all night. Oh my god. I don't know how someone's body could handle that. If he's alive even after that. Commander comes back and he unties Marv from the tree and he tells these seven other prisoners to stay where they are and this commander and several other Japanese soldiers they take Marv and they march him away from the group into the jungle and they march him over to this freshly dug grave and standing next to the grave that Marv would have seen is this Japanese soldier carrying a sword. And so Marv is told to walk up to the edge of this grave. They tell him to kneel down in front of this grave and they let him smoke a final cigarette. And apparently Marv very calmly smoked the cigarette. And when he was done, the man with the sword put a blindfold on Marv and then told Marv to extend his neck. And as soon as he did, he was beheaded. Afterwards, they buried him inside of this grave. That night, I mean, all these soldiers knew the result. I feel like all eight of these soldiers, now seven, know what's going to happen to them. Like, they know they're not coming out alive. They know this. It's understandable that they know this. So it's not shocking that Marv was so um, calm with it. Because he knew what was coming. One of the high-ranking Japanese generals on the island, a man named Yoshio Tachibana, who was an alcoholic and was notorious for his sadistic tendencies with prisoners. He was sitting around drinking, having a good time, when he decided that his soldiers, they needed to prove they had what he called the fighting spirit. And the only way they could show they had this fighting spirit was by consuming human flesh. And so Tachibana ordered his soldiers to go exhume... That's... That's that's where it went from Japanese so like understandable. That's where it crossed to ridiculous fucking insanity. When you're like, well, I don't know if you my soldiers have fun spirit. They need to eat someone. That's how they'll prove it. What the fuck? Um, Marv from his shallow grave, and then Tachibana sent over one of his surgeons, and he told him to remove Marv's thigh. So the surgeon goes over, he surgically removes Marv's thigh, he gives it to one of the cooks, and the cooks, they make this huge meal using Marv's thigh, and they serve it to Tachibana and his other high-ranking officers and some soldiers. And apparently, Marv's thigh tasted so good with soy sauce and with sake that Tachibana ordered his soldiers to go back and cut more meat off of Marv, which they did. Within a month of Marv's execution and consumption, Tachibana decided that he wanted to eat more human flesh, and he wanted his soldiers to eat more human flesh, because he and a number of the other officers were superstitious that this could make them stronger, and it would be good for their stomach, and it would be good for... This is some bizarre belief. This is a bizarre belief to have that like, hey, if we eat more humans, we'll become stronger. No, that's not how that works. We're bastards. For their health, and so they decide they're gonna kill more of the American prisoners and eat them. And so they brought the seven remaining American prisoners out to the rifle range, and once they were all out there, one of the Japanese officers grabbed 25-year-old Floyd Hall from Missouri. They pulled him out of the group and they walked him over to the middle of this range and they tied him to a wooden stake in the ground. And once he was in place, Tachibana, who was there, he ordered the other Japanese soldiers to work on their bayonet work on Floyd Hall. And so one by one, these soldiers would go up and plunge their bayonets into Floyd Hall's chest, into his stomach, until he ultimately died. Once he was dead, Tachibana, who had brought along his surgeons for this very reason, he sent them out to remove Floyd's liver and his gallbladder right in front of the now six living prisoners. They're watching- That's so messed up. That is so messed up. 
this happen right in front of them. And then once his liver and gallbladder have been removed and wrapped in cellophane paper to preserve them, the surgeons walked back and stood on the edge because they knew this was not the last execution of the day. And so the other six prisoners are looking around, wondering what's next. And then one of the commanders walks over and he grabs another one of the prisoners. His name was Earl Vaughn. He was 22 years old from Texas. And as soon as he was grabbed, he knew he did not want to face the same fate Floyd did. And so right away, he became defiant. He wanted to die more quickly. And so he began yelling Semper Fi at the Japanese. And he kept extending his neck and pointing up at his neck, indicating he wanted a clean and quick death. Behead me. And so the Japanese, they tried to strap him to this wooden post because they wanted the other soldiers to work on their bayonets with him, but it was just too difficult with Earl. He put up such a fight and he kept putting his neck out that finally one of the soldiers did pull him down and he was beheaded. And then again... To think that in anger they gave him what he wanted. He wanted to be beheaded. They were just like, freaking fine then. And just did it. Like, that's insane that they could just anger and they gave it to him. And the surgeons came running out into the field and in plain sight of the now five remaining American captives, they removed Earl's liver and his gallbladder and then wrapped them in cellophane paper to preserve them. And then they took Floyd and Earl's organs and they went back to the cooks to have them prepared. And that night, all the high ranking officers on the island feasted on Earl and Floyd. Within I'm surprised they didn't make the freaking other people eat them just so they would eat their own fucking person. I'm surprised. In a few days of Floyd and Earl's murders, the other five captives were also executed in a similar fashion, one by one, in front of their comrades. And two of those remaining five were also consumed. And unfortunately, one of those two was not executed beforehand. Instead, they had pieces of their body surgically amputated, and then those pieces would get cooked and eaten. And when they were done eating them, they would just come back and cut off more and more and more until there was nothing left to eat. And at that point, that prisoner was executed. They did this in order to keep their meat fresh. After the war was over, 34 Japanese soldiers, including General Tachibana, were tried for war crimes for their atrocities they committed against these eight prisoners of war. They were all found guilty and they were all hanged and buried in unmarked graves in Guam. The other men on the island that witnessed these atrocities and didn't do anything about it or participated, but in some sort of secondary way, they were also tried for war crimes, found guilty and sent to jail, but all of them were released after eight years. George was 80 years old when he finally learned about the atrocities on Chichijima Island that he so narrowly escaped. He, like everyone else that was learning about this, was horrified and disturbed, but more than anything, George felt a deep sense of guilt for having survived. But what we can all say for sure is that George did not waste his second chance at life. George H.W. Bush would go on to become the 41st president of the United States of America, and his son, also named George Bush, would go on to become the 43rd president of the United States of America two world leaders who would change the course of history forever, who never would have been if George Sr. had bailed out of that plane near Chichijima Island just a few seconds earlier. Think about that. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you... That was not a twist I saw coming. That was not the twist I saw coming. Wow. Alrighty, that was an instant twist. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all enjoyed this reaction video. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, subscribe to Mr. Ball, and the link to the original video will be in the description below. Thank you all for watching, I'll see you all for the next one.